In this section, I'd like to give a brief introduction to signals and systems without getting very much into the underlying mathematics. Uh, mainly, I'll introduce some basic terminology and also try to motivate why we might want to study uh, signals and systems to begin with. To begin with, I need to introduce the notion of a signal. So a signal is essentially just a function. Uh, except that when we use the term signal, usually it's implied that the function is associated with some kind of physical phenomenon. For example, maybe the function is measuring a physical quantity in the real world. So maybe the function is measuring temperature with respect to time or position with respect to time or something like that. Otherwise, there's not really much difference between the term signal and the term function. Now I need to introduce a little bit of terminology that relates to functions. We can talk about independent and dependent variables in the context of functions. So if I have a function f, and the function is a function of the variables t1, t2, and so on up to tn, we refer to t1, t2, and so on up to tn as the independent variables of the function, whereas the value of the function itself is referred to as the dependent variable. And there are many, many examples of signals. The list goes on essentially forever. But a few examples of signals are things like voltages and currents in an electronic circuit, uh, positions, velocities, accelerations, forces or torques in a mechanical system, uh, flow rates of liquids or gases in some kind of chemical process, even things like digital images, digital video, digital audio, stock market indexes. All of these things also can be uh, considered to be signals. We can classify signals in a number of very basic ways. The first is we can classify a signal on the basis of the number of independent variables it has. This is sometimes referred to as the dimensionality of the signal. A signal with one independent variable is said to be one-dimensional. An example of a one-dimensional signal would be an audio signal, where you have air pressure fluctuations versus time. So time is the independent variable. There's one independent variable, therefore it's a one-dimensional signal. A signal with more than one independent variable is said to be multidimensional. An example of a multidimensional signal would be an image where you have light intensity as a function of horizontal and vertical position. So horizontal position would be one independent variable. Vertical position would be the other independent variable. So there's two of them, and this is more than one. Therefore, this is a multidimensional signal. We can also classify signals on the basis of whether or not their independent and dependent variables are either continuous or discrete. So first I need to introduce the notion of continuous versus discrete values. So a variable that's continuous in nature is one that can take on values over a continuum. A classic example of a continuous variable would be one that's real valued. A real valued quantity can take on, for example, the value 0, it can take on the value 1, but importantly it can take on all values over a continuum between 0 and 1. For example, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, take, pick your favorite number between 0 and 1. On the other hand, a discrete valued quantity can only take on certain particular values. And a classic example of a discrete valued variable would be an integer valued variable. An integer can take on the value 0, for example, it can take on the value 1, but importantly it can't take on values between 0 and 1. It only takes on certain specific prescribed values. So with that in mind, we can introduce a few terms that relate to whether or not the independent variable of a signal is continuous or discrete. So a signal with continuous independent variables is said to be a continuous time signal. An example of this would be a voltage waveform, where you're, the voltage waveform is essentially measuring electric potential versus time, where time is a real valued quantity. A signal with a discrete independent variable is said to be a discrete time signal. An example of this would be a stock market index, where the value of the index is the closing value of the uh, stock market index at the end of the trading day. So it's defined only at certain particular points in time. It's a discrete time signal. Uh, you might ask, well, why do we use the word time here? Because there's nothing really that requires that the independent variable represent time, right? We could have a signal which is measuring some kind of physical phenomenon with respect to a position, like maybe, maybe you're measuring how temperature is uh, propagating through some, some material. So we're measuring temperature versus position. Uh, so it's a very natural question to ask, why does this terminology use the word time? So why is it continuous time and discrete time? It's just a convention, essentially. In a lot of applications, the independent variable does represent time. So for this reason, a lot of the t terminology kind of assumes the fact that time is the independent variable. And it's 
the terminology is sort of structured in this way. But of course the independent variable could be something other than time. But we still use this the same terminology nevertheless. We can also classify signals on the basis of whether the dependent variable, in other words the value of the function itself, is continuous or discrete. So a signal with a continuous dependent variable is said to be a continuous valued function. An example of this would be a voltage waveform where electric potential, at least if you ignore quantum effects and so on, is, is a, a quantity that can vary over a continuum. And a signal with a discrete dependent variable is said to be discrete valued. A classic example of this would be essentially any digital data. Digital data by definition only takes on certain prescribed values. And we can also define a number of other terms that kind of build on the terminology that was introduced above. So if we have a signal that is uh, continuous valued and continuous time, we call it an analog signal. And if we have a signal which is discrete valued and discrete time, we call it a digital signal. Often it's very helpful to represent functions in graphical form. I don't really have a lot to say about this slide because I'm sure that anyone watching this video has graphed many functions in their lifetime. The only thing I want to say is with respect to discrete time signals, um, sometimes I've noticed that students have a tendency to want to connect the dots and what I mean by this is when we're doing a discrete time plot of a function that looks for example something like this, there's a tendency for students to want to draw a line segment between this dot here and this dot here and then connect this dot here to this dot here by line segment and so on. But this doesn't actually make any sense if you think about it because for example if I draw a line segment from this dot here at minus 2 to this dot here at 1, this would imply that this function is defined at all places on the continuum between minus 2 and minus 1. But by definition this discrete time signal is only defined at the integers. So it doesn't make sense to connect the dots because this would imply that the function is defined at places other than the integers. So if you might be so inclined to connect the dots, resist the temptation to do so because it doesn't really make sense and it's not really correct. Next I'd like to talk about systems. So a system is simply some entity that takes in one or more signals as input and transforms them and manipulates them in some way to produce some number of signals as outputs. In this particular picture we have a m inputs going into the system it transforms them in some way to produce n signals coming out. And what the system does could be something very trivial or it could be something extremely complicated depending on the particular application. Just like in the case of signals, systems can also be classified in a number of basic ways and we're going to look at some of these ways now. So the first way in which we can classify systems is on the basis of the number of inputs they have. So a system with one input is said to be single input. This is sometimes abbreviated by the acronym SI. A system with more than one input is said to be multiple input or multi-input, which is sometimes abbreviated with the acronym MI. We can also classify systems on the basis of the number of outputs they have. So a system with one output is said to be a single output system, abbreviated by the acronym SO. A system with more than one output is said to be a multi-output or multiple output system, which is sometimes abbreviated with the acronym MO. Also, we were introduced to a bunch of terminology earlier, which relates to types of signals, how we can classify signals. And a lot of this terminology can be applied to systems to describe the types of signals that are processed by a system. So for example, terminology like one-dimensional, multi-dimensional, continuous time, discrete time, analog and digital, all of these terms which are used to describe or classify signals can also be applied to systems, meaning that these are the types of signals that these systems process. So for example, a one-dimensional system is a system that processes one-dimensional signals or a digital system is a process, a system that processes digital signals and so on. So we can reuse a lot of the terminology that was introduced earlier that is used to classify signals in the context of systems as well. On this slide and the next few slides I'd like to introduce some of the general application areas in which the mathematics of signals and systems which we're going to be studying can be used. So the first application area I'd like to look at is what I'd loosely refer to as signal processing systems. And on this slide I'm going to focus on the diagram on the top half of the slide because this is a configuration which is much more prevalent in the world today. And essentially what we have here is we have some kind of analog signal that we want to process. Essentially the world we live in is analog. So we have some analog signal we want to process, but we want to process it using some discrete time device, basically a digital computer or digital electronics.
So in order to do this, we have to first take our analog signal, convert it into some kind of dig digital or discrete time signal, then process it, and then convert it back to an analog signal when we're done. And this essentially embodies the processes of sampling and interpolation, which we'll look at later in the course. Maybe to give a little bit more uh, concrete interpretation of this diagram, let's actually consider a particular example. Suppose you have a, a microphone and you want to speak into the microphone and apply some kind of audio effects to your voice, maybe add echo or something like that. In this particular application, the, your, your, um, your voice, which is being you know, essentially uh, captured by a microphone is an analog signal. It's essentially a voltage that's induced in some microphone. So we're going to take that signal and we're going to convert it into a discrete time signal, which is a sequence of numbers. This is done by a continuous dis to discrete time converter. This is essentially embodying the process of sampling. Uh, then we take our sequence of samples that we receive which is just a sequence of numbers, a discrete time signal, and we process it using our digital electronics or digital computer, which is this discrete time system here. And then this will produce some output, uh, which is in the form of a discrete time signal. It's just a sequence of numbers, which we then need to convert back to an analog signal. So we feed this through a discrete to continuous time converter, which is essentially performing an interpolation sort of process to produce an analog signal. And then this would be something that we could play on our headset or our a speaker. It's the our voice which with whatever effect we've just applied to it by the discrete time system in the middle of this block diagram. So just a simple example but to give you a general idea of, of what I mean by signal processing systems. The next application I'd like to consider is communication systems. So in communication systems the basic problem that we're dealing with is we have some message signal or information that we want to convey from one point in space to another point in space. Where the, these two points in space may be separated by meters, tens of meters, kilometers, tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, even trillions of kilometers in deep space applications. But in all cases, the basic idea is the same. You're trying to get a message, some information from one point in space to another point in space. To make the example a little bit more concrete, I'm going to go through this for the case of a, a radio broadcast. So in this case, the message signal, the information to be sent, is just the voice of the broadcaster. So in this particular application, we don't really want the broadcaster just to scream really loud so everyone can hear. In other words, the, the original form that the message signal is in, in other words, air pressure fluctuations versus time, this is not a very practical way to broadcast things. Instead, what we would typically do is convert the message signal into a, a form which is more amenable to broadcasting, and this is essentially what this transmitter does. And in a radio broadcast, what we do is we convert the air pressure fluctuations with respect to time into electromagnetic waves. Uh, so the transmitted signal, the thing we're actually broadcasting, is the electromagnetic magnetic waves that somehow embody the original audio signal that we want to broadcast. These electromagnetic waves then propagate through the communication channel, which is just the atmosphere in this particular example. And then eventually they're received at the receiver, which is just the person, the radio of the person who's listening to the broadcast. And then the job of the receiver is to try to make the best estimate of what was the original signal that was sent, because there will be some noise and distortion added typically. So it does its best job to try to remove this noise and get the best reproduction of the original signal possible. In other words, the best estimate of the original message signal. And this is the basic idea behind a communication system. Another area in which the mathematics of signals and systems can be used is in control systems. So in control system applications, the basic idea or the problem that we're trying to solve is to be able to have some physical quantity in the real world track a desired value over time. So a very simple example would be a thermostat system. A thermostat system where the value we want to control is the temperature of the room. And we want the temperature of the room to track some desired value over time. And the value we want it to track is whatever the setting of the thermostat is saying we'd like the temperature of the room to be. To put this in the context of the diagram that's shown in this slide, which is labeled using some fairly standard terminology from control systems, we have what's called the reference input. The reference input is the desired value for the physical quantity that we're trying to control. 
the output of the system is the actual value that, of the quantity that we're trying to control. So for a thermostat system, our reference input would be the setting on the thermostat for what we want the temperature of the room to be. The output would be the actual temperature of the room. And what we do here is we measure the actual temperature of the room with a sensor, and then we feed this back, and we take the difference between the reference input, in other words, the desired temperature of the room, and the actual temperature that we've measured. And if all is good and well in the world, these two things will be equal, and when we subtract them, we get zero, and the error signal will be zero. So essentially our goal here is our mission in a control system application is we want to drive this error to zero, because if this error is zero, it means the desired temperature and the actual temperature are equal to one another, which is what we want. A good thermostat system should have this property. Uh, looking at the other blocks in this diagram, the plant in the case of a thermostat application would correspond to a, a combination of a heater and air conditioner. It's kind of a, it's the thing that we want to use to control the temperature. Uh, we use the heater to increase the temperature when it's too low and the air conditioner to decrease the temperature when it's too high. And the last block that we have here, the controller, this is the thing often as engineers that we need to design. It's the thing that looks at this error signal and decides based on whether the temperature is too high or too low and by how much is it too high and by how much is it too low, it decides how much should I turn on the air conditioner or how much should I turn on the heater and so on in order to try to drive this error to zero. In other words, to try to make the actual temperature more closely track the desired temperature. Of course, a thermostat is not a very ex exciting example, right? Most of us probably don't aspire to become engineers so that we can design thermostats for the rest of our life. I mean, someone has to do it, um, but uh, probably a more interesting example might be something like a robot arm, where in the case of a robot, a robot arm application, the reference input would be probably the, end p the position of the end of the robot arm, and then the output would be the actual position. So the reference input is the desired position of the end of the robot arm, and the output would correspond to the actual position. The plant would correspond to joint motors, the actual motors that we apply voltages to to actually move the various different uh, parts of the robot arm. And the controller, again, is the thing that looks at this error signal. It looks at how much does the, the measured position of the end of the robot arm differ from the desired position. And if they're equal, then this error would be zero, but in, the, in most cases they won't be exactly zero, and then this controller has to figure out essentially what voltages does it apply to the various joint motors to cause the end position of the robot arm to more closely track the position we'd like it to have. So this is a few examples of control system kind of applications. So in the preceding slides, I introduced a number of application areas in which the mathematics of signals and systems can be applied. We looked at signal processing systems, communication systems, control systems, and there's many other application areas as well. But even just signal processing systems, communication systems, and control systems covers a huge amount of ground in engineering. There's a lot of jobs that revolve around these areas. So the mathematics of signals and systems is really quite fundamentally important, and it's not something that we just simply learn as engineers and quickly forget because it's not important. There's a lot of jobs that rely on this sort of mathematics. But of course, we don't really like to learn math just for the fun of it, right? So like, why is it that we're really learning this mathematics in the first place? Why do we really need this? And the reason for this is the systems that we build get increasingly complex as years go by. I mean, if you even look at something as, in quotations, simple as a cell phone, and a cell phone is not really that simple, but relative to some other things, it's relatively simple. Um, it's an immensely complicated thing, and without having some kind of mathematical models and so on, it would be dif difficult, well, not just difficult, impossible to guarantee that it would ever work. So when we're building systems, we want to have some kind of mathematical framework that we can use to, to have some confidence, for example, that systems that we're building are going to work before we even build them. You, know, you don't want to spend millions of dollars building some bridge and then it collapses you know, as soon as the first vehicle drives over it because you know, if you had designed it properly from the beginning and mathematically modeled it, you would know it wouldn't work and it was going to collapse. So these things are really quite important for, for ensuring that we can design systems that are quite complex and still meet the required specifications for, for safety or performance and so on.
And when systems fail to operate in, in the way that we expect them to, sometimes the consequences can be quite catastrophic, especially when safety is involved and lives are on the line, you know, planes crash and so on. And these things are quite, uh, have quite disastrous consequences. At this point, I'd like to introduce an example of engineering gone wrong. In other words, I'd like to show what sort of things can happen when systems are not designed properly. A particular example that I'm going to use here happened quite a long time ago, and it's a classic example to use, which is why I've chosen it. Probably people like to use it because it happened long ago, so all of the people that were involved in this fiasco are long since dead, and you don't have to worry about offending anyone. But I'm sure that you can think of, in your mind, of a lot of more recent uh, failures that are have been in the news lately. It's not like this happens only once every hundred years. It happens all too frequently, unfortunately. So the particular motivating example I want to consider is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This is a bridge in Washington State in the United States uh, that links Tacoma and Gig Harbor. Uh, this was a very, very long suspension bridge at the time it was built. This was back in the 1930s. Uh, the bridge cost over six million dollars to build, which was a lot of money back in 1938. The bridge opened on July 1st, 1940, and then on November 7th, 1940, it collapsed. And the really interesting thing is the bridge was designed to withstand, supposedly, withstand winds of up to 120 miles per hour. And on the day it collapsed, the winds were only 42 miles per hour. So the, the bridge obviously didn't meet the specifications that it was supposed to be designed to meet. And the bridge collapse was essentially caused by wind-induced vibrations. Things have natural resonant frequencies that they vibrate at, and vibrate at. And the wind just happened, even though it was not particularly strong, it just happened to hit that natural resonant frequency. The bridge starts vibrating, and because it's not properly designed, the energy and the vibrations don't get dissipated, and the bridge starts vo oscillating with a greater and greater amplitude until eventually the structure can't stay intact anymore, and it just rips itself apart. Uh, the, the failure of the bridge was completely catastrophic. They had to just rip down what was left, which wasn't much, and start over. Uh, fortunately, the only fatality was a dog that was trapped in an abandoned car on the bridge. I guess this calls into question, though, like why was there an abandoned dog there? I guess someone didn't value their pet very much, which is kind of sad. Uh, but anyway, it could have been much worse. There could have been a lot more deaths, uh, some non-human ones, in, or some human ones involved as well. And again, this is just a, a quite old example because there's, you know, no one that can be offended by this example. But, you know, there's lots of more recent examples. Uh, you know, hello Boeing, 737 MAX, uh, and so on. On this slide, you can imagine that there's a picture of a bridge collapsing. Simply for copyright reasons, I don't want to include an actual image. Um, but anyways, you'd probably be more interested in watching a video anyway, and there was it, the collapse of the bridge was captured on video. So if you'd like to watch a video of the bridge collapse, you can uh, view it at this particular link on YouTube. Last time I looked, there were about 12 million views of this video, so it seems to be quite popular.